can follow their rights. They have more money than we know what to do with in Namibia. Mm-hmm. List the NAMDEP holdings. Again, you take a strategic equity holding and you turn that into some liquidity, right? Yes. Okay. You can do the same thing with NWR, put that together, PPP that, ask a whole bunch of best global practice um, mm-hmm. people in the tourism sector to come and, and bid to run those institutions and run yeah. them well. Three different examples of optimizing your balance sheet. What do you do with the cash? Super, super important. Mm-hmm. I would not just take the cash and give it all to Kali Shalekvan. He's a, he's a great dude, but, <laughs> you know, like, and, and sometimes it's just about you don't need to tempt the man yes. that much because when he has all this cash, his fellow ministers, of course, are going to harass him because they're all going to want this yeah. money for various things. For sure. Take that money and reduce your debt, right? Uh-huh. Take care of a few things, those two euro bonds. Yeah. You know, really put some money in that sinking fund, but also begin to make your debt matrix look better. Mm-hmm. That's step one. Step two, for me personally, I would put that, I would see the sovereign wealth fund. Okay. Uh, why am I saying that? Sovereign wealth funds globally have mm-hmm. a significant amount of oversight onto them. Um, and in fact, there's like an international federation for sovereign wealth funds, yes. which if we seed one, we should belong to mm-hmm. because there's a peer review mechanism there where they look at what are you doing with that money and you have to abide by certain rules. Yes. So the reason I put it in a sovereign wealth funds is primarily for governance reasons. And you typically attach a few objectives to that sovereign wealth fund. Mm-hmm. One of them could be infrastructure development. Yeah. So some of the pushback here was, hey, James, but you put this money into a sovereign wealth fund. We need the money today. I'm not saying the sovereign wealth fund can't start spending the money today. In fact, yeah. it can. What you want it to be doing Governance. is spending it in a way that makes yeah. sense, in a way that's transparent. Because like in Rwanda, their sovereign wealth fund releases mm-hmm. financial statements, their citizens read this thing, you debate this thing on social media, what are we buying, why are we buying, that sort of thing, right? Yes. Whereas at the moment, it's, you know, with so many ministries, it's, just, it's really hard to see what it is that we're spending the money on on each ministry. So I would do those three things. Um, and then I think we'd be cooking with a bit of gas. Why do I say this? Of course, we're trying to be fiscally prudent. But it'll be very hard to jumpstart meaningful economic growth from fiscal prudence. Mm-hmm. What fiscal prudence is helping us do is it's helping us stop sliding down a very slippery slope to, to fiscal oblivion yeah. and the loss of fiscal sovereignty, right? Mm-hmm. But so, like surviving is not enough. Yeah. What we need to do is to thrive. What we need to do is to be able to stop, turn around, grab this hill and climb to the top of the mountain. And for that, you typically do need um, fiscal stimulus. You need... Some, somebody to be able to pump money into an economy. Now, the only person with a balance sheet that could do that systemically is the state. The private sector would love to follow, but they would obviously need the appropriate yes. um, uh, sort of uh, environment. Look, and I'll probably get my head bitten off. People are saying this should be a private sector-led uh, recovery. And I agree. Investment yeah. from the private sector is required. But I'm telling you, the private sector might find it really hard to deploy capital in an environment where the government is broke and acting potentially inappropriately yes. just because of their fiscal pressures. Yes. Because then your return on equity will be super poor anyway yeah. as a private man. So you need the government to be able to sort itself out, lay a strong foundation mm-hmm. where we can all build on on growth. Um, yeah, yeah. I think one important fact... Um, just in line with that is that there's always an opportunity cost when it comes to spending your money. Of course. So, I mean, it's difficult for, if I, if I was in the private sector, I wouldn't spend it in this country, to be honest, you know. Like you said, I might get my head bitten off, but I do think there are better alternatives. And yeah, it's, it's just it's just a sad, it's a sad thing happening in this country. You know, governance is really low. But I must say that was one of the best, um, you know, um, advice, you know, to the, to the government I've ever heard. And I didn't expect that actually. So, I want to ask you a difficult question, sure, so you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But yeah. let's look at Namibia as a whole, right? Just the way we we move in. Let's, let's look at SACU, firstly, the oldest custom union in the world. Sure. 40%, to be more specific, 39% of our budget comes from SACU revenue. Right. Right. But what SACU has led this country into is now we, we're just focusing on being consumers. We're really not producing anything. And I think that's because of the free trade agreement within the Saku, Saku area, you know, you don't have to pay tariffs from South Africa. And they're so much better developed than us. And that just means we can't compete with them, number one. And number two, their, their products are just much better, you know, in terms of price and, and quality. So if you, if you had to choose today, would you choose to have Namibia exit Saku 
or do we just have to renegotiate those terms? Because this is a very difficult one for me, and I don't know the answer myself. Because we do benefit, I think, in terms of goods and services we get from South Africa specifically. But if you do look at the history of SACU, it's the oldest custom union in the world. It was invented by you know, the apartheid South Africa. And I think oh. it might have been created to keep the dependency of the neighboring states. And nothing has really changed since then. So I was just really curious as to, right. to your opinion and if you have a solution since you're such a critical thinker today. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, John, I would say that my answer depends on on what do you want as a country? So that's yeah. where I would start. So, you know, because that's, that's definitely like a fork in the road situation, yeah. right? So to me, it would start with at the gut, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you want for your people? And the way I would do that is try to be as, so it's what I was talking to you in the beginning, try mm -hmm. to be as data-driven about my analysis. Yeah objective but also uh, like infuse a lot of humility into how i approach it what do mm -hmm. i mean like practically yes all this stuff to me would come back down to our, our long-term national development planning and you know as i said in the panel i think that's definitely one of the things that we need to put right up there in terms of before we start building a new dam uh, mm -hmm. building new roads airports whatever we need to distill our thinking and calm and think about where do we want to go as a country? So what does NDP 6 look like and what does Vision 2030 look like? But really, what does it look like relative to where we are today? So we need to be able to adjust. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a practical example of what I'm talking about. So I was lucky enough this year to, uh, to have gone to, to Harvard Kennedy uh, and nice. I learned about infrastructure. So I was yeah. in a sort of two-week infrastructure uh, in the markets economy course and I met a ton of really cool people. One of the guys I met there worked at a, uh, at a sort of USAID sponsored thing called Power Africa. And they concentrated on uh, providing, you know, the cont continent with affordable electricity. Yeah. And he said to me that there was a plan uh, for a mega solar project in Namibia, right? Um, essentially, I didn't know this, but they said we had like the best or the second or the third best irradiation resource in the world. AKA sun, sun hitting your yeah. ground and, and you know, it's potential for solar. The second best in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, you remember how you, in your question you say to me, oh, you know, like what goods we should be exporting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where I think our failing is. Mm -hmm. We keep on looking to each other for solutions as if we own all of the ideas or we are like the best generators yeah. of ideas. We aren't. Sometimes it's, it's good to be humble and listen to others. So this guy says to me, you know, They've done this, a similar project in Morocco. They could build a solar plant here, uh, a CSP and uh, so concentrated solar with, with PV, uh, you know, 200, 300 megs, uh, mega, megawatts in the beginning. And it, they could build that in phases to become a three gigawatt power plant. That's huge. All right. So I was like, really? Well, our national consumption is like maybe 600 megs. Yeah. And we import most of it from South Africa. So just think about that. The yeah. Americans go to war uh -huh. to ensure energy independence. We are independent politically. Yeah. But like if we went to war with SA, they could just shut off all power. <laughs> there, there was a time this year with the drought, yeah. we imported, I think it was 90% of our power. Wow. Are you really independent? Like that is the very element yeah. of industrialization. 90%. I think it was 90%. Yeah. And now power guys can can give you the right <laughs> so then i said interesting but you can easily turn a situation of energy dependence mm -hmm. into becoming one of the largest exporters of energy into the southern african power pool that to me is a game changer of course like that is we we go from you know exporting meat fish diamonds and uranium to becoming one of the largest power producers in southern africa and we become a key component of actually driving the cost of industrialization down. Because the gains that you get from, mm -hmm. from um, economies of scale is massive. Mm -hmm. There are guys out there doing solar on 80 cents per kilowatt hour. I think you were sent. Yeah. That's crazy daisy cheap, right? And they're saying the larger this thing gets. the mm -hmm. So to me, that helped me start thinking about our export basket very, very differently. And these guys want to pay to actually do the feasibility study, 12 million US dollars they're going to spend in our country. All we needed to do was to sign an MOU and let them potentially try and unearth yes. a whole new export industry. Mm -hmm. So 
let's not just confine our minds to goods and services because if you do that then you go and you focus on the soccer trade union mm -hmm. in a very binary fashion mm -hmm. um the other thing that we did this year was uh within the high level panel we managed to to get a, a professor from harvard called um, ricardo houseman to come and sort of talk to us about he does a lot of economic growth plans for other countries around the world whether it was jordan panama etc mm -hmm. so he comes in studies your economy and and suggests a few sectors that your economy is well positioned to transition to and diversify into. Now, he, you know, he has, you know, for your viewers, you can go check out, I think, the Atlas of Economic Complexity. Mm -hmm. He has like a, a site where you can look at a whole bunch of countries and look at how they've evolved over time in terms of the export basket. That it, it was crazy daisy cool mm -hmm. to see what he has done with other countries, but also how they think about economies. And it's like, unlike anything I've seen here. Again, humility, right? Because you need to be able to say, hey, I need help. Can you help me yes. look at my NDP 6 and my Vision 2030 from a global and regional context, but yet retain, obviously, the focus on the importance for my people here in Namibia. Yeah. And as we started doing that, we were looking at things we should be getting into from biofuels and all sorts of stuff, right? Even some medical equipment, for, for example, which uh -huh. was really interesting, manufacturing, stuff like that. Now, when you do that, there's, there's something else that the National Planning Commission was putting together called the DFA report. I would actually beg all your viewers to read it. I'm asking mm -hmm. everyone at the high level panel to read it. Um, and, and some have read it, some have not. But... The DFA report, it's called the Development Financial Assessment Report or whatever. Mm -hmm. It basically says you have a whole bunch of goals, developmental goals. You want to do this and this and this and this. You also have a different portfolio of money. So whether it's pension fund savings, banks, or FDI, yes. or even you know um, sort of climate funding, like funding that could come in that is very, very focused on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And now you need to try and marry your projects and ideas and development goals with the right type of capital. That is huge in investments, right? Mm -hmm. You don't fund everything with debt. You don't fund everything with equity. You need a mix. We do that. We yes. learn that in CFA. Of course, yeah. Why don't we do that as a country? If I want to fund a solar plant, should I go just get bank funding? Should I just go and get equity? Mm -hmm. Or should I also include some, some money from the climate fund, which will be super cheap and super developmental orientated? or a combination of the three. And as a country, when we built our Nectral Dam, we built our roads, we built our airports, we just used government money, we just used debt. That's interesting. I mean, what's right? hitting me right now is that I think we should really take up securitization more seriously. I mean, Regulation 13 is, it explicitly states 45% of pension fund money needs to be invested Correct. into Namibia. Correct. If I'm not mistaken, I don't even think that the NSX alone would make up 30% in terms of free float. Even. So what actually happens to that excess cash almost? You know what happens to it, bro. It goes yeah. into government debt and then uh -huh. we use the government debt to build a road or ah, an airport okay. or to pay your salaries. That's so where so all you wouldn't say going. it goes into call accounts ever? You think so, that government no, no, debt is so enough? It definitely goes into call account, right? Yeah. So a lot of it goes into NCDs, some mm -hmm. of it goes into treasuries and some of it goes into government debt, right? Other than the equities that we buy. Mm -hmm. But here's the real thing. Namibia is intricately linked, interlinked mm -hmm. and arguably almost incestuous, right? Because yeah. the money that goes into treasury bills comes from pension funds, but the banks need to buy some of that money, but the banks are also recipients yeah. of some of the, you know, the NCDs. What you're basically doing is you're taking your institutional savings pool like this and you're sloshing it around in a really, really small asset pool. Yeah. Bank NCDs, treasury bills, government debt, like, and they're all borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Yes. Think about this for two seconds. And I've mentioned this to a few clients, so I don't mm -hmm. mind saying it online. When you take money from John Morgan's pension fund contributions, yes, and then you use that to fund government operations, right? And 50% of our operations are John Morgan's salary. You take a contribution from his salary to buy government debt, mm. to pay his salary, to take half of his contributions, doesn't make sense. Uh, just, just begin to think about yeah. that, right? Like, if half of what we borrow or what we're spending is going into your salary, are you that bigger driver of productive capacity for this country to mm -hmm. generate future revenue? 
or can we be allocating our money a bit differently? And that's just yeah. one thing to look at, right? At the moment, we're taking some money, we're going to be using it to bail out different SOEs, right? Potentially in Namibia, yes. Siemens needs to be looked at, RCC. And we're doing this without doing that DFA thing I was asking us. So the structure for this is called an integrated national funding framework, mm -hmm. where you sit at the top from a very strategic planning point of view and you say, I only have $100, but I have $1,000 worth of problems. How do I allocate a finite set of resources to these problems to unlock the greatest return on investment so that I buy myself and I earn the right to deal with problem number 101 to 110? Yeah. Right? Uh, and when we were talking to Harvard, they were talking about binding constraints. That is things that are really, really holding the greatest area of potential on your economy down. That could be a port, that could be a piece of, whatever it is. And when you find one or two of those binding constraints that you need to take care of to unleash growth, you then go after them very clinically with, with the few hundred bucks that you have, mm -hmm. right? That sort of thinking is the type of policy augmentation I would be asking our policymakers to think about. Yeah. And we can't do that alone. And that's okay, right? We need private sector so that local asset managers need to get involved in that conversation, right? You know, a guy from Harvard Kennedy School would need to get involved in that conversation. People from the National Planning Commission can get involved in that communication. And then say, you know, Office of the President. And when you do that well, after that, you can begin to cascade meaningful, strategic directives to your other ministries, energy, water, mm -hmm. uh, transport, ICT. Uh, you know, we have a shore. Nanda is a very strategic asset relative to Rwanda, and not mm -hmm. just because of the port. Think about this. Google are going to build the largest undersea cable in the world. They're actually already building it. They want to land a node in Namibia. What potential industries does that open up for us that we're not even thinking about? Yeah. You've got Paratus trying to do the whole uh, mm -hmm. thing across the continent. Should we rally around a company like that more strategically as a country? Do you think the U.S. rallies around their strategic mm -hmm. champions? Do you think the U.S. rallies around Boeing? Of course it does, right? Mm -hmm. They would give Boeing strategic contracts to build spacecraft and defense craft, like stuff like that. So are we rallying around? We don't have a Boeing, but if Paratus, forget that it's you know a company owned by a few, if, <laughs> if Paratus was a strategic asset, given yeah. that we have a Google node landing here, how should we be engaging Google yeah, we should be and Paratus to try and export internet mm -hmm. connectivity to Rwanda mm -hmm. or any other landlocked country? Export internet connectivity. I'm not saying let's export beef and diamonds anymore. Yeah, you're saying electricity, I'm internet. I'm saying diversify yeah, of course. and look at what are you naturally endowed with, mm -hmm. right? It costs nothing for us to get the sun. It costs nothing for us to have a show. We already have it. Can we turn those geological and geographical bounties and gifts mm -hmm. into a diverse... And you know what? When I was in New York, I spoke to Google. Um, sort of, I went there with a the high-level panel, or I, I, was, yep. I was a member of the high-level panel, and we went there to look for strategic investors, and we spoke to Google. And Google would love to land the node here. All they want is for us to adopt certain policy interventions, a.k.a. open access, they don't want only telecom to be the guy who provides yes. internet access to MTC and everyone else. They want everyone to be able to access the node, mm -hmm. right? And that would facilitate competition mm. and cheap prices. What do they want? What does Google want? Google wants cheap and e easy internet access for you. Why? Because the cheaper and more accessible it is, the more time you're going to spend on YouTube. 100%. And, yeah. and consuming their... Like, mm -hmm. that's a conversation to be had, right? Yeah. And 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 that's what I sort of mean. Like, let's, let's be creative yeah and in the way it is that we want to to grow our economy from here yeah, that's quite interesting to me i mean i'm listening to you and you're saying we have the opportunity to actually have worthwhile investments absolutely but if you look at the infrastructure in namibia let's look at something closer to home sure the namibian stock exchange right there's still a paper-based system with a five-day settlement period correct that's i think that's substandard to even zimbabwe who they have quotas everywhere so i think i don't understand why there's such a reluctance for us to just open it up to to the public um do you, do you have an answer for that or not yeah because i mean 
it doesn't make sense. Is is there money in keeping it paper based? I don't want look. My head's gonna you know, get bitten off from this, but I'm an independent. No, um, look. This is why you have a YouTube yeah. channel, homie. You know, yeah. You should be so I want I want to say <laughs> I've been advocating for the NSX to be simply abolished. I think sure. we can just work straight onto the JSC. It'll be a lot more efficient. And I can guarantee you right now, you can test it. I'll, I'll drop the NSX number um, in the in the bio. Sure. Call them and ask them what the price of FNB is today. Right. And then you'll see why I think they they're really incompetent, and it right. doesn't make sense for them to even exist, in my opinion. So. NSX existence JSC very specific question. Mm -hmm. Here is my response to you. Again, you go back to what do you want for your people, mm -hmm. right? If you want deep capital markets, if you want diversity, if you want easy access to financial information, then you will design policies that champion those things for your people. Do you know what one of my um, one of my biggest assessments for what you just said is? Mm -hmm or at least I think one of the biggest issues is passiveness. Agreed, yeah. Is I think as a people, we're extremely passive and we're extremely okay with average and we're extremely okay sometimes with, you know, some like just not good enough. Yeah. And we don't make enough noise. We don't complain enough, right? Um, you know, yeah, there was a documentary recently done by um, some Icelandics or whatever on, on, <laughs> on a few things that went on in Nam. Yeah. There was a caption in there that absolutely bothered me to the core. And they were, it was right in the beginning and they were describing Namibians. And they said, Namibians uh, are a bunch of jolly and lazy people. <laughs> wow. I think they actually say cheerful and lazy people. It's almost, yeah. Can we just, just take <laughs> two seconds to think about that? And, and you know what? No one has picked that up in the media or no one's talking about it. Yeah. These people, it, it just reminds me like back in, I don't know, 12th century or something. You rock up and there's a bunch of villages, there's a whole bunch of gold there <laughs> and you just shoot them all and you take, <laughs> take the, the gold, gold and you go and industrialize your country, right? Yeah. They came, they saw a bunch of lazy people and we're all yeah. cheerful. We don't pay enough attention to yeah. our resources and they took it. That's kind of like a resource curse. I mean, if you look at countries like the East Asian countries, they don't have any resources, but and they're so productive. So, so here's the thing for me. The, this is why I think people like you who have a YouTube channel uh -huh. or any other access to media are, is absolutely vital. The young people, including mm -hmm. myself, need to not be okay with average. Mm -hmm. We need to be voicing our discontent at, at, at poor value propositions. Right? The French, man, those dudes, they used to like riot for everything. They still do. And they still do. Right? And sometimes they end up getting really good benefits as yeah. employees for that. I'm not saying we should pull a Hong Kong or a yeah. Lebanon. Yeah. What I am saying is we need to show our leadership structures that we are not okay with average. This NSX story, you know, what we're doing in Namibia, whether it's the NSX or the CSD being held up by the FIM bill. Yes is we're absolutely disguising the price for mismanagement. Mm -hmm. Our bond yields today are, are absolutely disguising mm -hmm. the price of the way we're running the country, mm -hmm. the cost of it. Yes, because of Reg 13 almost, right? Right, and that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You can go NSX, CSD, forget all that stuff. Just principally, mm -hmm. we are disguising the cost of how we're doing a bad job and platforms like this and, and anything else, newspapers, um, investigative journalism in general, is pretty useful at helping people see things that they typically don't, because there's information asymmetry. Mm -hmm. As an asset manager or as an investment guy, I have a lot more access to information than most of my clients. And I have a duty to serve my clients and their best interest, right? Uh, the state, I would argue, would be the same. Mm -hmm if not worth, they have way more information than most of their citizens. Of course. Uh, and sometimes investigative journalism helps with that a little bit where people get to see a bit more uh, of what's going on and then they mm -hmm. can demand for, um, for better service. So for me, also, if you bring something like a CSD or you're, where you allow investors, international investors to be buying and selling your instruments, price discovery will be a lot better. Not just the actual price of the stock, but the actual price for mismanagement. So if, if, if a foreign guy came in here and bought our bonds based on our fundamentals, the yields that they would be willing to pay would be a really good indicator to our people, our government, of just how expensive mm -hmm. 
what we're doing really is. Because at the moment, we're getting a really artificial sense of how expensive it is to borrow. We're already spending 11% of our revenue on, fix, uh, on, on servicing our debt. If we didn't have Reg 13, it would be much higher. Yeah. And you know what that would tell us? It would tell us we need to stop messing around, right? And we need to do something different. So we're denying ourselves that urgency. What do they say? Necessity is the mother of all invention. And for as long as we're killing necessity by artificial tap, tapping in, artificially tapping into your pension fund assets, you're denying the inventiveness mm -hmm. that is required to solve the problem that we're in. Yeah. You know, that, that would be my general take on, on all of this stuff. Um, I think what you said with, with the NSX, you know, it, it's your opinion. I mm -hmm. think we do need to open things up better. Mm -hmm. I think we do need to allow more liquidity. I think we do need to encourage more companies to list. Um, and we're not going to solve it on a blog, but certainly if you got a government that came to the private sector and said, guys, this is what we want to do and that's where we want to go. What interventions do we need to design together to get us there? Mm -hmm. That would be a fantastic mindset of course, relative to where we are at the moment. Right. Yeah. No, that was powerful. Thank you so much, my friend. Yeah, cheers. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having See me, John Morgan. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. And uh, hopefully one of these days we get to come back. 100%. Absolutely. 100%. Thanks, man.